for you're so worthy, you're so glorious, you're so mighty, you're so wondrous. Father, it doesn't matter what the devil's doing. It doesn't matter what's going on in life today. Many may face great opposition, great resistance, great things going on in their life, even in a negative way, but none of them are as great as our God. And we praise you today. We thank you today for you are El Shaddai, the all-sufficient one. We thank you. You are our provider. You are our everything, Father. And we thank you today. You're greater than any mountain greater than any valley, greater than anything the devil tries to do. For the Word says we've been given authority, power, but authority over all the works, over all the power of the enemy. So just from that one scripture in Luke 10, we can see plainly, yep, the devil may have some power, but it pales in comparison to the power of God. And we've been given that power. We've been given that authority. So there's some things he may can do, but what he can do to us as far as bringing defeat is nothing except for what we allow. Because he does not have the authority that we have. We have authority over him. He doesn't have authority over us. We've been given authority over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt us. So what's been sent to hurt us, it shall fall and it shall fail. For no weapon formed against us shall prosper it might be formed, but it shall fail. Because this part of the heritage that we have is not only servants, but saints. It's children of God. So we love you today. We praise you today. We glorify you today. You're so worthy. You're so worthy of our praise, our honor, our glorifying you, Father, in all this said and done. We magnify you in your mighty name above all things, Father. We this morning cast aside every thought, every idea, every distraction, Father, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, knowing the work you've begun inside of us. You will able to bring to fruition and completion as we trust you, no matter the devil's plan. We thank you, Father. We're like Joshua and Caleb. We're the two of faith that's going in to the promised land. We thank you today. I thank you as the pastor of this local church assembly. Father, you're the only one that knows the state of every heart and life. You know what the people in this place are facing today? What's to come tomorrow? So, Father, we depend upon the Holy Ghost now. And I thank you now that the words that are spoken will not be man's plans, thoughts, or ideas. But what does say it the Holy Ghost? Fresh off the press from heaven, it's going to minister directly to their hearts and minds. They've come expecting to receive by faith, and as they receive and leave this day and apply it, their lives, their families, their witness will be changed forever. They're going to go out here and be the lights of the Lord Jesus Christ and the gospel of salvation to shine in this dark days, darkness of this world. Thank you for the word. Thank you for the Holy Ghost. Holy Spirit, as we prayed this morning, you got free reign. Your presence is already here because you're welcome. One minister said, you're a perfect gentleman, which is biblically right, and, and, but we welcome you. We choose not to grieve you, not to hinder your flow. Direct our steps, our words, and all that's said and done this morning, and we thank you at the last amen. All that's said and done will give you the glory, honor and praise you so deserve, and these lives will be changed, challenged, and honor forever. Never to be the same again. We count it done by faith right now in Jesus' name. God is with us. You can be seated. Thank God for the Word. Thank God for the Holy Ghost. Thank God for all that He's done and all that He's doing. Amen? We're just going to follow Him. Do you believe you come to church this morning? God's going to speak to you. Yes. We can go through the motions, but we don't want to just go through the motions. I want to hear not just Sunday and Wednesday, but definitely on Sunday and Wednesday. I want to hear every day what God is saying. Right? What does He have to say to me? And as I pray and seek God's face about these services, that's what I pray. Not what I think. Not me analyzing your life and figuring out what you need from the Word. No. We don't want to cut the Holy Ghost out. Which happens very often. We need to be led and guided by the Spirit of God. If you have your Bibles, turn to Revelation chapter 2. Starting in verse 1. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You're so good. And your mercy endures forever. You know God cannot assume ascendancy or take control in your life until you make the conscious decision to surrender to Him. Jesus accomplished the will of God by surrendering His will to fulfill God's will. You and I walking in the steps of Jesus will accomplish the will of God 
by surrendering our will and walking in His will. Right? If you want it your way, it'll be your way. If you do it the way the world does it, your life will be shaped that way. But if you choose to surrender your will to the will of God and like Jesus said, not my will, not what I desire or want, but your will be done. God's will and His plan and His best will come to pass in your life. Yep, you'll face great opposition along the way. The devil and many others of his party, they'll not throw a party for you, but it doesn't matter. As we just said, in line with the Word, His plan will fail. Amen? So we're going to accomplish the will of God. We're going to accomplish the plan of God. We're going to walk in God's best. Our best days are yet ahead of us. So I don't know how you can say that. Well, I say it this morning. I don't see all the great opposition that I've seen in my life. But I said it when it looked the worst. And I said it when it looked the best. And I'll continue to say it because it's God's Word. And the truth of the matter is you've got to first receive it. Get your mind renewed. Receive it in your heart. What you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, you're going to see it in your life. We're going to speak the Word only is what the centurion said to Jesus. He said, I'll come lay hands on you. Servant, I'll come pray for you. He said, no, speak the word only and it'll be so. He was a man that was under authority and he understood authority and he walked in authority. Thank God today we've been given authority over all the works of the enemy. I have been studying and praying for myself, obviously. I don't know about you, but I need it every day. Give me this day my daily bread. I stepped into this year seeking God, still seeking God, Listen to the Spirit of God. And before this year, last year, He began to deal with me about change. You know, there's a place that He wants us as a church to, to walk in. It doesn't just happen just because we come every week. We must be willing to surrender. Must be willing to change. Must be willing to adjust. Even when it hurts. I said even when it hurts. Right? There's a very big mentality today to come to church and, and get a feel-good message and won't change your life. You need the meat of God's Word. You do need it delivered in love by all means, but you need the truth, for you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. And as I have stepped in to this year, I've been studying and praying obviously for myself, but for the church. One of the things we've been endeavoring to do is plan better than even before, which is great, and there's things we have to do. I'm not belittling that. I'm not saying that. But I think we have to be very careful so as not to plan God the Holy Ghost now. Have to be careful so it's not just to come to church and say, no, I want this and I want that and I think it should be this way. But God, what do you want to say to me today? How do you want to move today? If you want to move at 11, great. If you want to move at 12, 30, great. What do you want to do today? Here I am. Use me. Here I am. Speak to me. Very often it can be the parameters that we have set in our mind, the expectation that hinders God from accomplishing the fullness of His plan in our life. And we don't want to do that. So as I've been praying and seeking God's face, I ask Him daily, Lord, give me this day my daily bread. Number one, you know what I need. Number two, what do you want to get to me to get through me? And then thirdly, what would you have me to do? I pray that seven days a week for my own personal life. That's usually how I start out in the morning time with the Word and, and in prayer every day. But then at the same time, he begins to speak, and you have to decide whether you're going to listen or not. So I had some plans, and I told you last week uh, and, and about the vision of the church. We're still having vision Sunday, the last Sunday. I'm going to say some things specifically. The direction of the church hasn't changed, but where I was going to be ministering on change and the importance of change, he's had me to more so minister, like I am in just a moment, he's had me to more so minister on what we need to change. Because we can say all day long, this is even the will of God, and this is what the book of Acts looks like, but if we need to change to get there, we need to know what to change. Titled this this morning after I got here. I already had a title, something else I had to go in there and change it. After I come out and prayed, I went back again. You say, well, you ought to hear God perfectly all the time. I'll get to where you are one day, but I'm still in a, I'm still a working process. Yeah. And I have to determine and decipher because God deals with me again about personal things and everything He deals with me personally. Maybe that's what I need. Not the whole church needs at the moment. So I don't preach everything I study because some things are just for me. But this morning, this is just for you. And it's just for us. Matter of fact, you're deceived if you leave here and say, that message is not for me. Because this was for everybody. This is what the Lord spoke to me. And, and again... It may be for a month. It may be just this morning. I do not know. But this is the title. 
the greatest need of the church a revival of love now I'm going to show you some things you might not have seen maybe you have but you can get it again that the Lord showed me a revival of love and we're talking about what kind of love not, not this world's love it's foolishness just, just you can get into it deeper we will sometime or another but as we talk about agape love, the love of God, your Revelation 2, 1, right? We'll look at the church of Ephesus in just a minute. This, this world, this, this love that's presented in the world is, 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 a, is just that. It's a worldly love. It's a, it's a natural human love. It's not the love of God. The love of God does what's best for you. This, world that is, this love that's presented in the world does what you want it to do. That's, that's not the love of God. The love of God always does what's best for you. It's like a good example would be for your children. You say, I love my children too much to correct them. The, first, the very first thing that the love of God does is love God, and it expresses itself in implicit obedience to God's Word. So it's impossible for me to say, I love my children in the love of God, and then disobey the Word concerning correction of my children. You understand? I don't love my children. Not in God's love if I don't correct them. Right? Because that contradicts the word. But in Revelation chapter 2, this is good. Verse 1, Under the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith, He that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, he said, I know thy works and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them that are evil. Believe it or not, we're not supposed to embrace evil. Right? And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not. They're liars. You say, well, that's, that's kind of rough. Well, let me finish it. And hast found them to be liars. Jesus said that. Amen? You get in the Bible, you get a new definition of love. It's the God kind of love. And hast borne and hast patience and for my name's sake has labored and has not fainted. Jesus has commended the church of Ephesus for those things. Right? How much of God do you want? Part of Him? Own all of it. Verse 4, He said, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee. He said, What's He got against you? Well, if you've ever been in prayer and listened to the Spirit of God, and God asks you a question by His Spirit, or He says, Do you know what's wrong with this? You know what's coming next. He's fixing to tell you. Right? He said, I have somewhat against him. What did he say he had against him? He said, you left your first love. He said, you've left your first love. Remember, therefore, verse 5, from whence thou art fallen, and repent. Curse of the day, but then repent. And do the first, if you miss it, what you, should you do? Repent. That's not a four letter word. Repent. God, I was wrong. Repent. Whence thou art fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I'll come unto thee quickly and remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. And all that's good. But I'm, I'm, I'm just I'm working towards the point the Holy Ghost gave me. You know how we minister. You might be able to say there's more before and there's more after and needs even more in that scripture. You go home and get it all and enjoy it. You should, and you can. But I have to share in church with you what the Lord tells me for the body. He said, I have somewhat against thee, verse 4 of Revelation 2, to the church of Ephesus, which would be to us as well. Aren't you his children? He said, you've left your first love. And again, this love is agape. This is the love that God is, and the love that God has, and the love that you possess if you're a Christian. You have God's love in you. Right? Romans 5, 5, latter part says the Holy Ghost has shed abroad the love of God in our hearts is shed abroad at salvation. Now, in, 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 in Galatians 5, starting in verse 22, the fruit of the Spirit. We see the fruit of the Spirit listed there. That's not the fruit of the Holy Spirit. That's the fruit of your recreated Spirit. Right? And as you abide in the vine, you produce that fruit. One of them being love, and really, love encapsulates all of them. But he said you left your first love. The word first there in the Greek, it means your foremost. It means place, order of importance. I'd ask you this morning, what place does the love of God have in your heart? What place does the love of God have in 
your life, your home, your family. People say, well, you should preach on something else. There's nothing greater. Foremost place, order of importance. The church in Ephesus, this is, and you can study this for yourself. You know, you hear it often today. This church spent time, they talked about the good old days. Remember how it used to be. When we come to church and have a good time and the Spirit of God moved. And the altar was full. And so and so, you remember they was dancing in the Holy Ghost. You remember so and so was laid over here on the floor. You remember so and so was set free from such and such on such a date and time. You remember all these times. But it's the way it used to be. Not the way it was anymore. And he's telling them what was wrong. He said, you've left your first love. Yeah. Why was it no longer the way it used to be? Love had lost its place in their lives and in the church. Yeah. 2 Timothy 3. I've been studying these things for a long time for myself. But the Lord just has impressed it the last several days to share this this morning. 2 Timothy chapter 3. We start in verse 1. I'm not going to read all of that. You can read it. It's, it's about the church in the last days. It says the church will have a form of godliness. Form is appearance. It looks that way. You know? You say, what does it mean look that way? Well, you got your suit or your dress on this morning. And you smell good. And you glory hallelujah. Might talk in a little bit of tongues. But you got all in your heart. And you got a problem with other people in the church. You got other problems with other people everywhere. You say, you're judging my heart. Now I'm just ministering the word. I have to judge my heart. I can't judge your heart. Only God can do that, and only you can do that. You and them together. I don't know the state of another man's heart. Now I can see the fruit thereof, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. It looks a certain way. Where is the power? Where is the glory? Where is the Holy Ghost? You know, I get to praying. You learn this about your faith walk. People say, why am I going to confess this in my mouth and believe this in my heart? And how is this ever going to happen in my life? And what if there's things there? You step out in faith and God the Holy Ghost who's the revealer. He'll show you stuff that's wrong. And he's told me, he said, how do you want in the church, the body of Christ today, to be full of the Holy Ghost when most people's full of themselves. You say, how do you know who you're full of? Whose will do you promote? Whose way do you want it? Do we want it God's way? Or do we want it our way? And a lot of people say, my way is God's way, if it's in line with the Bible. So I want to move with the Holy Spirit. What kind of spirit? What Holy Spirit? Spirit of who? Spirit of God. God is love. He said, we'll get there later on, there's two major forces at work in your life, if you allow, you can go either two different ways, because as you are, what, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away, behold, all things have become new. The Spirit of the living God by means of the Holy Ghost comes to live inside of you. He makes your spirit brand new. He recreates your spirit with the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God is love inside of it. And when that changes, everything changes. The problem is, is that i got a soul. Made up my mind with an emotions, right? That's, that's my thinking. And then i got something else called a flesh. This to be brought into subjection. My spirit is to be the king, and I know that. And my soul is to be my is to be the servant, and my body senses to be the slave. What's the most popular thing talked about today? How you make me feel. Destruction. Hundred percent of the time, when you go by how you feel, it's over before you even get started. We don't go by our senses. We bring our senses, our flesh, 
in the subjection. What God wants, we can say it one way. As we say it all the time, we'll say it backwards. God wants the senses, the flesh, brought into subjection to renewed minds. Minds renewed with the Word of God. And He wants renewed minds brought into subjection or submission to recreated spirits. But if we let our flesh run wild and just do what it wants to do, who's it about the two major forces that you see in operation? You really don't see but one. But you see love, which is the nature of the recreated spirit because it's the nature of God. It's the nature of the Christian. Or you see selfishness. It's the nature of the flesh and it's the nature of the devil. Second Timothy 3. One, this know also in the last days. We all say it's the last days. The proof of that is in the Scriptures. Perilous time shall come, Amplified says. They'll set in. It says in verse 2, we can read all this, we don't have time. Men shall be lovers of... What does it say? Men shall be lovers of their own selves. Amplified says, people will be lovers of self and utterly self-centered. Love, God's love, is not selfish. It's the opposite of selfishness. Did you know that? It's not greedy. Love is generous. For God so loved the world that He... If you listen as we move into this, and again, I don't know how far we're going, but nothing will set you free. More than walking in the love of God. Nothing. You'll have enemies, but they choose to be your enemies. Let them be. You'll have people that oppose you. You'll have people that hate you. You'll have people that don't like you. But what people do will no longer affect you. Because this is, you operate not on the defensive, so to speak, and stay offended. You operate based on who and what lives inside of you. Matter of fact, the love of God by definition means several different things, but in part it means it does what's best for the objects of His affections regardless of circumstances. That last part's critical. Regardless of circumstances. It's a divine love. It's God's love in the believer. But who decides whether you walk in love or not? And you're going to be accused of not walking in love either way, but just do it and you'll have a freedom like you never had before. Look at Acts chapter 4. Did I tell you that or not? 32. We say many things, but do we mean them? Do we mean them? He says, well, I, I, I want to move a God that we've never had before. I remember the good old days. I was upstairs. This has been many years ago. And again, I've learned about faith confession more than I did then. And I said, Lord... What's wrong with me? I don't feel like I used to. Which is not relevant. I know that. This has been many years ago. I said, I don't feel like I used to. I said, used to, I used to be hungry. And I used to be desirous of the Word. At this particular time in my life, and I was looking back. And the Lord said, just as plain and simple, number one, you don't say I'm not hungry. You say I'm hungry on fire and full of God. That's what you said. This, that, this has been many, many years ago. Probably 15 or so. But, but I, I made that statement and, and I said, Lord, what's wrong with me? And one of the things he said, he said, well, if you want to get the results that you got back then, what you need to do is go back to doing what you used to do. Which is studying and praying, seeking His face and praying in the Holy Ghost, doing different things. If we wanted to be like it used to be, we might have to make some adjustments. We might have to make some corrections. We don't have to put our will aside. How bad do we want the will of God? Cursing today. But how much of a price are we willing to pay to see God move? To see God have His way? 32 of Acts 4. We say, I want to be like the book of Acts. The multitude of them believed that believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither said any of them of the things that he which he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection. And the Lord Jesus and great grace was upon them all. That's anointing. Neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them, brought the prices of the things that were sold. 
You say, you're trying to introduce a doctrine. 100% not. I'm, I'm getting to a point. And laid them down at the apostles' feet. And distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. Were they just concerned with themselves? Did they care for one another? Did anybody else matter? It's on the move of the Holy Spirit. How's your love walk this morning? He said, so and so's my enemy. You're going to have enemies in this life. Jesus did. But they have to declare themselves your enemy. You don't declare them your enemy. You just watch your mouth. You can remember what was it 1 Peter 3 says? You've got to watch your mouth if you're going to see good days and have a life that you love and enjoy. You have to keep your tongue. You have to keep your mouth. Say, so and so's doing this. It's got nothing to do with you. Just give it to God and keep on going. Right? If we're going to walk with God, we're going to walk in love. You're going to master walking in the love of God. E.W. Kenyon made this statement. We do not need a revival of religion. We need a revival of eternal life. The life and nature of God that resides in every believer. Every Christian has the nature and life of God in them. The nature of God is love. So when we are yielding to our spirits, what's going to come out? The love of God. When we're yielding to the flesh, how are we going to be? Complaining? Murmuring? Griping? If they only do what I tell them to do, it worked. We're going to follow God. If you have a revival of love at your house, everything will change. Starts in your heart. At the church, everything will change. You say, I can't do what everybody else does. No, but you can bring your part. You can do your part. Amen. You can just take this very room. We have a heart and desire. It's great to reach the world with the gospel. How are you going to reach the world if we don't care about each other? He said, that'll reply to me. Well, then you would agree with the word if you walk in the love. And what I just said wouldn't offend you. We have people sometimes, and I get asked a lot of questions. They say, why don't so-and-so do this? Why don't they do that? Why don't so-and-so come to church? They, I always tell them the same thing. They don't want to. That's why they don't come. <laughs> don't you do what you want to do? Well, not mine. Why do you do what you want to do? Say, so even if you fulfill the will of God, yeah, but it's because you make a conscious decision to surrender your will, you want to please God. Right? You say, why does so-and-so choose all these other things other than seeking God and getting fed the Word? Because they love something more than God. Then I will tell you that, but it's the truth. I was never going to be a preacher. So I'm going to accomplish the will of God for my life. I'm going to have this great ministry. Not if you don't walk in the love of God. That's the only thing that's ever going to keep you in the place God's called you is the love of God. You say, I'm going to walk by faith. Faith without love is nothing. It's nothing. It doesn't mean anything. And it'll get you nowhere. The greatest lessons I've ever learned in my life is what we're talking about right now. I thank God for it every day. Matter of fact, if it wasn't seen as hypocritical, I would call the people's names that's done me wrong. But I would tell them thank you. And I know they think I'd be trying to be sarcastic. That's why I wouldn't do it. But it's sincere. I would like to call their names publicly and send them a letter and write a book and make sure the forward was in there. Thank you so much for your attacks and your deception and everything you did behind closed doors. Because it caused me to get behind closed doors too. Amen. But I learned that my identity is not in what somebody does to me. My identity is not in all the sneaky people that like to operate and try to cause division and discord. Amen. It rests in my love for God, His love for me. And I'm not going to allow what somebody does over here to affect me from helping who God's called me to. Amen. People are dying and they're hurting. As we stand here, we have to have a revelation. People are dying at this moment and dropping into eternity in hell. I wonder how many bickering and fighting church members got around them that were so caught up in what they didn't like in somebody else's life that they didn't tell them about Jesus. What matters? What matters most? 
Above all else, he said, in order of importance, what's one? What's first? You say, God's first. Yeah, it is first. But the first and greatest commandment is to love the Lord God with all your heart. We need to get in the Word of God and get our minds renewed. There's, and I'm not knocking nobody. I know these people mean well. I don't even know who they are. One of the big popular things today is, is this, this movement that says, I am second. No, you're not. That's not liberal. Don't say that. That's ignorant. You're last. That's biblical. It is. The first and greatest commandment is to love God. The second one is not you. That's not biblical. Now, people come with all this little cute stuff in the church, but it's unbiblical. I see it all the time, and it very much grieves my spirit, but I'm not going to attack people. But it'll help you. You're not first, and you're not second. God's way is last. Jesus Christ. The only begotten Son of God in John chapter 13 got on His knees and washed the disciples' feet when He was headed to death. Amen. He washed their feet. He said, well, I don't think we should do the foot washing in the church. I didn't try to get you to wash anybody's feet, but there's a principle there. There's a principle there. Nothing that He did. And one of them, He washed their feet was Judas. And Judas went and did what He did. Now He's in hell this morning. Celebrate for what He did. But Jesus got down on his hands and knees. And he washed all of his feet, including Judas. He didn't allow what anybody said did or even what he knew was to come to affect who he was. He's God in the flesh. Who do people see Jesus in today? Do you know the purpose of the Holy Ghost is to make you like Jesus both in character and in power? Who do people need to see Jesus in their lives? <coughs> James chapter 3. I pray the Holy Ghost helps me to share these things. I'd like to minister on for a couple of months, but I never know what I'm going to do, and I'm going to quit telling you what I'm going to do other than follow God. And I say what I'm going to do, and then He changes it. So I'm going to, uh, we can say we got any plan we want to, but it's always something to change. So let's look at James 3 real quick. We need a revival of the love of God in our hearts. It'll change everything. God's never, and then I got this revelation many years ago. He said, I can't do this, and I can't do that, and I can't do the other. He said, I can't, I don't, I don't, again, some of these things I don't do public because I know people think I was mocking people, and I'm not. But I have people as my enemies. And in my flesh, there's no good thing. And in my flesh, there's no good thing for them. In my flesh. But I have the love of God in my spirit. And people say, I can't forgive so and so. Well, just right after that confession, we just say, God is a liar. God is not just. Because the reality of it is, I learned this a long time ago. You might not know how yet. And you need to learn that. But the Bible, we, God's never told you to do anything that He didn't equip you to do. So if He tells you to forgive, and what I said is, I don't do this stuff publicly. By no means. I don't do it where nobody can hear me. But there's different times in my office or in my prayer closet at home. I get and I call people's names based on the scriptures over in Ephesians 4 and many others. And I say, I forgive so and so in Jesus' name. Stuff rises up in my heart. I have a flesh too. And you like to choke them, but you can love them and forgive them. And then when you don't mess with them, people say you don't love them, but it's fine. You've got to know where your heart's at with God. Right? Every one of you tell the truth. I've noticed this. You all have people in your life that don't like you. Y'all have people in your life that don't love you and that you don't have nothing to do with. It don't mean you don't walk in the love of God. Maybe they don't, but let it be. Don't let other people determine the state of your heart. You determine the state of your heart. You determine where you are with God. If we don't have love according to the Word of God, we don't have anything. Me and Arlene loved each other since we got married, but when we got a hold of walking in the love of God, it changes everything. It'll turn your house from a place of whatever it may be to a place of heaven on earth. You try to, what does love do? Love serves. When my mentality is, I'm there to do everything I can within the confines of the Word to take care of her, make her life better, and that's her desire for me, it works out good for everybody. But what does selfishness do? It destroys. You don't do this. You don't do that. You're not this. You're not that. You're sorry here. You're sorry there. That's selfishness. That's where all the complaining comes from. You don't do what I want you to do. That's the message that comes about. You're not here to promote your will. 
You never succeed in trying to make yourself first. Trying to make yourself important. That's not God's way of blessing you. We're going to see some things. That's not God's way of fulfilling you. So, oh my God, if we just... Carlos mentioned this word on uh, Wednesday night. What is it? Meditating on the Word of God is important day and night. And, 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 and again, I do not say this to be critical, but it might not be the title. It might not be what, what you wanted to hear. But it's, it just, that's, that's how far we left. I said, it's just something that I, nobody can bypass. You can't bypass you and your God sitting down with the Holy Ghost and your Bible. It, nothing. I don't care how many preachers you listen to on TV. I don't care who you listen to. You need to know by the Spirit of God what He's saying to you this morning. And, and this morning it might be coming through me, and I pray many, if not all of you, has already talked to the Lord, but when you wake up in the morning, everybody wants to talk to everybody else and be social. You need to know God. Amen. Spend time in His presence. How do you get to know anybody else? Spend time with Him. James 3, 13. Who is a wise man? And a dude with knowledge among you. Let him show out of a good conversation, matter of life, his works, with meekness and wisdom, of wisdom. If you have bitter envying and what? Strife in your hearts. Glory not, and lie not against the truth. He said, This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devils, devilish the wisdom of the world, which is the wisdom of the devil in essence. It, it may come across as wise, but the reality of it is, it's promoting your own self. Selfishness. Promote their own will. Where envy and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. Where envy and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. Strife in and of itself, and I'll look at definition in a minute, but it's the manifest presence of the devil. Strife. It produces factions. It produces divisions. It produces a us versus them instead of we're in this together. It goes along with envy. It goes along with jealousness. Look at Isaiah 14. Do you want to be like God? Do you want to be like Jesus? Do you want to be like the devil? Look at Isaiah 14. We'll look at the devil. Work backwards. You know, when I was an enemy of God, separated from Him, He gave His only Son to die so that I could have eternal life. I have people to say, well, if I walk in the love of God and do what you're talking about doing, who will take care of me? God. If I don't look out for myself, who will look out for me? God. Isaiah 14, verse 12. How thou, how art thou fallen? These words are important. Got them circled and underlined in my book. From heaven, O Lucifer. Lucifer, Satan, right? Son of the morning. How art thou cut down, fallen, cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? So he's fallen. He's cut down. Which did weaken the na nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I, do you see that? Who do you want to be like? I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. I, I be careful how much you use I and me. And then talking to others, you don't. Do this and you don't do that. The love of God is not concerned with what everybody else does. It is not responsive in the sense of I'm waiting to see what anybody else does. No, the love of God expresses itself implicitly in obeying God's commands. I choose what I do by and through the love of God. You say, I'm going to follow the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost to who? God, who is love. We're love children of the love of God, he said in 15. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell. To the sides of the pit. Now what did he do? He exalted himself. I will ascend. I will exalt. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation. I will ascend above. I will be like the most high. I, I, I. 
But what's that? This is the result of his pride. This is the result of his selfishness. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble? That did shake the nations? You know what he's saying there is a different than what we're talking about, but the truth of the matter is, people are going to see Satan and say, My God, is that the one that caused all these problems? He's a little pinsqueak. But as we yield to the flesh, we allow him access into our lives. We don't want to do that. We want to obey God. We want to do it God's way. And God's way is what? Love. Philippians chapter 2. This whole chapter is good. And it's actually where this message started. My title of my message, the other one that I had prepared, is, is all found in that chapter in Philippians 2. But it says, the title was, Love Considers Others. We live in a society and on jobs and in homes when it's all about me. You can't walk with God and it be all about you. That's not biblical. It's unbiblical. If you're going to accomplish the will of God, you put others first. You definitely put God first and you put others second. Right? What place is your place? Last. And people say, well, if I put me last, what will happen? Well, it says he'll exalt or promote those. They put themselves back at last. We'll look at it. Matthew 23, 12 is one of them. But, but look at Philippians chapter 2. You said you wanted to be like Jesus, and I believe you. He said in verse 1, if there be any consolation in Christ, any comfort of love, any fellowship of the Spirit, any bowels and mercies, he said, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love. Is that what he said? Being of one accord and of one mind, why don't we have unity very often? In the home, in the church, wherever it's at, why is there no unity? Because you got so many wills involved. Everybody wants to exert their will. If you got all kind of people that want it my way, how's it going to be God's way? Now this is permeating every area of your life. I, I mean, I'm, if it affects you as a church, that's great. But I'm not up here getting on you as a church. But just the reality of it is, if we don't elevate the love of God above all else, there's not going to be any move of God. You have to care about the people that's lost, hurting, broken, addicted. I get asked about different things in the church sometimes. And I don't, this isn't towards anybody. But I get asked about whether it's the babies crying or hollering or, or whether it's people making comments over here, laughing and not paying attention. Or whatever. And people say, and they'll ask me, does this stuff bother you? I always say the same thing. It doesn't bother me for me. That's what I say. What it bothers me for is people that need help. The people that need the Word. The people that need answers and, and need to be touched by God today. That's why it bothers me. Bad. It's not about being nitpicky and it has to be about me. I didn't come here today. It's, about, it's not about me. That's not the purpose. We want to make it about Him. But we're serious about the Father's business. You think about it this way. And it doesn't matter which one of them you fall under if it's being irreverent about anything. What if it was one of your family members? Maybe your son. Maybe your grandson or daughter or granddaughter. And they're broken. And they're going down a wrong path. In a horrible way. And you've witnessed to them. And you spend hours on your knees praying for them. And they finally come through and say, yes, I'm going to go to church with you. And then they come to church that Sunday. And somebody don't give a rip enough, they don't care enough about anybody else to disrupt the service and get the attention on something else. And then if you say something to yourself, you don't care about no, it ain't me that don't care. Don't lie to nobody. It ain't me that don't care. I do care. I spend hours praying before every service that I come in this church. I do care. I know people are broken. I tell God regularly when I'm back here in this office, I thank God I'm not there today. But I sat in church in prison in my spirit, inside. I know how it feels. I know there's people here this morning that are broken, that are struggling, that need to hear what God is saying, that need to know the way out. I don't come here because it's about me. And I'm not here to make it about me. But if I come into church and there's different things going on, and how do you think these people feel when they have prayed and worked and witnessed and God has moved and they get there and the only thing that takes place in the church is distractions because people don't care. I said they don't care. It's not about you. 
It's not about me. We say, I want to see this move of God. What kind of move of God do we want? I just ask this stuff sometimes. What are we really talking about? If we talk about a move, do we just really, is it not that we just want to come and just sense the anointing and maybe we fall out under the power and we get what we want and then we go back to doing everything we've done? Do we really want our worlds turned upside down? Or do we want them just like they are? Do we want to be like the other church you came from? Or the other church down the road? Or do we want to be like Jesus? He didn't do things in any certain order other than obeying the order of the Spirit of God. Matter of fact, submit yourselves unto God. That word in the Greek, submit, it means to arrange yourself under in order. That's going to be a conscious decision whether my life submitted to God, my family submitted to God, my finances, my church, whether it's submitted to God or not, it's, got, it's, it's my decision. So I want God to move, but I don't care the cost. Okay, what if we say next Sunday, we're going to come and we're just going to stay till he moves? Will you have a, a change of opinion at 1230? Things will change for a lot of people. People say, I want everybody in church. I don't. I want those who want to know God. How messed up they are, what color they are, what gender they are. I don't care nothing about none of that stuff. I don't care if they're demon possessed. If they want help, bring them. Bring them. People ask me about homosexuality and all these kind of stuff. It's demonic perversion, but God loves every one of them. And through you and me, every one of them won't help. He wants to set them free. I want to be the hands and feet of God. Do we really want what we're saying that we want? Do we mean? That's what the Lord has been dealing with. Do we really want it? Do we really mean it? Or are we just talking? Is it just lip service? See, because if we fool everybody else, we have to fool God. I'm not a church, as you know, kind of person, and I can never accept it. It doesn't matter if I have to fight against it the rest of my life. I don't want church like everybody has it. Oh, we come and we feel good and we go home. No, no. I'm in the body. It's not about me anymore. I'm developing and growing, but I am now a representative and an ambassador and a reconciler. i got a job to do to reach the hurting, the dying, and the lost. People say, How's, how did it ever get that way to begin with? Well, we miss out on it. We don't see it because the world keeps getting worse and worse. And so long as the world is so much worse than the church, we don't see that the church has been heading the same direction. We might not be as bad as far off as the world, but we should be going the opposite direction. Selfishness has no place in the life of the Christian. It will destroy your life and rob the life of others around you. He said, everything's great in my life right now. You don't determine whether you're walking by the Spirit and walking in love or not when everything's going your way. I, I know some people and I love people and I, I, I'm for everybody. And I just, I don't say nobody past my family because I'm not trying to hurt people. I've got no benefit in that. We say, oh, so-and-so is such a great person. I always say the same thing. You don't find out how great somebody is when everybody's doing just what they want to do. You don't find out how great somebody is when everything's pleasing to them. You find out, Daddy used to say it, this goes back to the character of God, but Daddy used to say that's where the rubber meets the road. You find out what you got. Not when people's kissing up to you. When people's talking about you. When people's cutting you down. Then you find out if you go on the love of God or not. You don't find out when you get a group of people that celebrate you all the time. That's correct. People say, go where you be celebrated. People say, if it matters to you, it matters to God. That's popular all the time now, even in the church. Well, what if you're attracted to somebody else's wife or husband? That's important to you. So what's important to me is what matters most is what I'm saying. That's the way to complete unfulfillment in life. I can't believe I'm going to look at things. <laughs> Philippians chapter 2 verse 3 says, Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than themselves. Oh my God. And, and it tells me that's being like Jesus. Let nothing be done through strife. And strife is what? As we already saw. It's the manifest presence of the devil. Where there is strife, somebody's yielded to the flesh. Always. 
That's why a lot of times in the house, people say, well, I don't understand. The day is good, and next week, oh my God. Well, that's because one day, you might be yielded to the Spirit, and then you yield to the flesh, and things don't go your way. Let nothing be done through strife, or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind. Strife in the Greek. 2052, it means faction, contention. It means selfish ambition. We use these words in the church. I've heard them repeatedly. People brag on others. They're a greatly very ambitious. If you repent, God will forgive you. You'd be shocked at the things that, that are bragged on in the church that directly contradict the Word of God. So I thought a work. I'm not talking about that. When we get over into selfishness, yes, you and taking care of yourself and your family, yeah. But if you get into the definition of selfless, the latter part of that, it means at the exclusion of others. I can say, well, I love my family, that's that's good, and you should. But if your family is the only people you love, you only care about yourself and what interests you. We're supposed to care about other people. We're supposed to love other people, right? Selfish ambition. Strife also means a desire to put oneself forward. Another in the church, that word means to consider over in, it, it means to let each esteem other. It means to consider others better than themselves. As we grow and as we change, there is something wrong in a person's heart. When you have a problem when somebody else is promoted or blessed. We should be able to celebrate not just who celebrates us and each other, but you should be able to celebrate and joy when God blesses or promotes a brother or sister in Christ. Something is wrong if you can. If somebody drives up in a new car today that's been faithful and they're tithers and givers and it, you have an issue with it, they don't have an issue, you do. You would have to ask the question, why does it affect you? To see other people blessed. That's not something wrong with other people. We don't have it here because I don't tolerate it. But I, I've been around it for years. Even among churches there's great competition. There's no place for competition in the body of Christ. There is a right or wrong. But there's different churches that may be called and anointed. To do different things and bring different parts to the body than we are. They are important and so are we. Right? Why can't we both be important? Why can't we both be needed? See, when there's contention, is that being led by the Spirit or is that being in the flesh? That's yield to the flesh. Yield to the senses. I feel this way and I'm going to let you know. So let's just talk about it. We all need to sit around and talk to each other. Not if it contradicts the words. You don't need to utter a word. You bring it into subjection. Right? Through strife or vain glory, empty, glorying, self conceit. Now, I want you to take this thought with you. Some of these things directly contradict a major train of thought among many people today. But vain glory, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, it also means self esteem. Did you know self esteem is not of God? You say you need to work on your self-esteem. No, you don't. You can try, but you'll never be happy. You'll never be fulfilled. The cure for low self-esteem is not to develop high self-esteem. What's the cure? I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Galatians 2.20 The life which I now live in the flesh... I live by faith in the Son of God. Right? It says, he said, Christ liveth in me. The cure to low self-esteem or no self-esteem is finding your fulfillment and your identity in Jesus. Right? That's why you have to be so careful even today, people that have low self-esteem. And then they'll flock to the messages the you matter messages. You say, I do matter. Yeah, but that's not how you move forward. It's by gaining more attention on yourself. They never get out of that place by doing that. 
coming out of that place is not by finding yourself. That's how we got all the genders we have now. All the confusion we have now. People are trying to find themselves. Christians are not looking for themselves. You have everything you need in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is to be elevated above all else. And many studies about things and practices and procedures in the church to get you to a resolution is not found that way. It's found in the person of Jesus. Jesus is your righteousness. You say, I'm not worthy. You are in Christ Jesus. He is your righteousness. He is your redemption. He is your sanctification. You say, I'm trying to be holy. That's not how you become holy. Coming out of that place of low self-esteem, it doesn't happen by finding yourself, but by finding Christ, His ways and His love. What did He say in Colossians 2.10? He said, I am complete. You are complete in Him. Jesus is His name. It's losing my identity, surrendering my identity, and gaining, I already possess it, but gaining my identity in Christ Jesus. It's not who. Look at, what is it, Father Mark? Verse 6. What you're to acknowledge. It says in Philemon, verse 6, Philemon, have you said, that the communication of thy faith may become effectual or effective by the acknowledging of how unworthy I am. How much of a failure I am. How good of a family I come out of or not. What I have been through. No. The communication of my faith becomes effective by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in me. How? In Christ Jesus. So I can't walk in love. The God of love lives inside of you. You can love the person even in the body that rubs you the wrong way the most. Do you know that? Loneliness of mind is having a low self-opinion. Excuse me, having a humble opinion of oneself, not low. But let each esteem others better than themselves means to consider, to think of, or esteem. When you get a hold of this message, you'll never say again, well, who do they think they are? They don't deserve this. They don't deserve that. You'll never say when you walk in the love of God. They're going to get what's coming to them. Because if your heart's right, even though people may get what's coming to them because they reap what they sow, that's not what you desire in your heart. You say they're going to get theirs. When you step out and say they're going to get theirs, you're going to get yours. Love is the way. I know from the word and personal experience. You can do what you want to do. He used to be one of the meanest people around. Believe it or not, at the place I've arrived at now, I don't know you believe that. In all reality, compared to the way it used to be, it is the truth. But love is the way. Yield to the flesh. Trying to have things, everything your way, all the time trying to control everything. Let God be God in your life. And when you let God be God in your life, what's going to have the way? Ascendancy. Love. Right? What's the nature of Jesus? It's the nature of love. It's the nature of God. We'll close with 1 Corinthians for today. I may not go in there, but you go to the turn to 1 Corinthians 13. Now you go to over in John 21. You remember Peter and John talking to Jesus. You know, Peter's worried about how John's going to die or not die and all that kind of stuff. You know what Jesus said to him pretty much? He said, what's I got to do with you if you live till I come back? So this is what the other man or woman's doing that's got nothing to do with you. You can't leave here and walk in love for anybody else. You can walk in love toward other people. But that used to say all the time, you'll get better or better. You, you need to take this passage and if you have a struggle with this, you need to pray it daily. When you first start out, you might need to do it two or three times a day. But he tells us in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1 through 3, in, in essence, that it doesn't matter what we have, if it's not accompanied with love, what do we have? Nothing. 
But if we went down to verse 4, and NLT and Amplified is the two that I usually use, but I don't have them in front of me. But verse 4 says, Charity, which is love in the Greek, suffereth long and is kind. You know love is kind? How many people you know is kind today? Not just when things are going their way. You know. Love in, envieth not. There's no jealousy in love. Charity, love, vaunteth not itself. It's not puffed up. It's not proud. Does not behave itself unseemly. Seeketh not her own. One of the big things that we're going to drive in if we keep going this way, but you get it yourself if not, love's not selfish. There is no selfishness in love. Right? It's not easily provoked. Thinketh no evil. Rejoiceth not iniquity. Rejoiceth in the truth. It beareth all things we've already established. That's cover over with silence. We looked at that last week. Along with 1 Peter 4 8. It covers with silence. You say, you won't believe what so-and-so did. If you go to lunch today, that's what you're talking about. That's what somebody did. You're out of love. Then don't get upset when things don't go right at the house. At the job. Or you have no peace. Amen? I'm going to let you go, but I want to say something to you real quick. God told us in 2 Timothy 1 verse 7, God's not given us a spirit of fear, but a power of love and a sound mind. Right? This is just an example that the Holy Ghost gave. This is what we do. This is our diagnosis. Someone's in fear. They're overcome by fear. We say, that's a spirit. That's right. It's true. We let them know it's a spirit. This is right. We tell them James 4, 7, resist the devil and he'll flee. We either tell them to do it or we take authority over here, over in the church and, and the spirit of fear has got to go in Jesus' name. But nothing changes and it doesn't work. Why is that? 1 John 4, 17 and 18, verse 18 says, there is no fear in love. But perfect love casteth out fear. Because fear involves pain. If a man gives way to fear, the Bible says this, he that, King James says, he that feareth is not made perfect in love. Weymouth translation says, love has in it no element of fear. But perfect love drives away fear. Because fear involves pain. It says if a man or woman gives way to fear, there is something imperfect in his love wall. And the Holy Spirit said, do you see where you missed it? You've tried to cast out or get people to resist a spirit of fear very often to no avail. Because they are the ones who's opened the door to the spirit by getting out of love. If they'll get back in love, they'll get out of fear. So we thank God for faith. We thank God for authority. But perfect love means active, means mature, complete love. When you're walking in the love of God, it's like you remember, Carlos is using an example Wednesday night about being scared in the rapture came. Well, I remember all those days. You just want to see how much chicken noodle I had in the, in the, in the cabins. How long you could make it. If daddy and mama got raptured out, you was in trouble because you're pretty sure you wasn't going. But, but, but as you get older, and I, I, I'm very humble in saying this, perfect love cast out fear. You know how much fear is in death? When you know that you love God and you know that God loves you, you know how much fear is in dying? I mean not 1%. I had lived live my life out and thank God lived my life out. I've got a certain number picked out and then me and God's going to talk about it. You say, I don't believe that. Well, that's why you won't walk in but I do believe it. But just the reality of it is, it wouldn't be what's best for my family. And I want to live a life out upon this earth going to and help people. But there'd be no concern for me if I dropped dead this evening. Now, I'm not speaking down on belief, I'm not saying I'm going to. But there's no fear. There's no fear of death. I know the love that God has for me and the love I have for God. I know in this earth, Acts 24, 16, Paul said, my conscience is void of office toward God and man. I don't care what nobody does to me. There's people that I don't mess with. I stay away from, but I wish no bad thing happened to them. Nothing. Well, nothing happened to them. Say, so, well, so and so might happen. This might happen. Yep, yeah, but, but my heart has to be clear. And when you are in love, you have no concern. You know why? Because you know God's got you. He's got you. He's got you. 
It doesn't matter what happens down the road. It doesn't matter what happens in the news. When you love God and God loves you and you understand that the covenant to that degree, everything's okay. It's good. It's fine. Worst case scenario is you'll be in heaven with worse. There's no fear in love. I'd encourage you today, if you have fear concerning the future, check your love for them. Check your love towards God and God's love towards you, which is, you just need to know that. He hasn't changed it. You need to understand that God's love towards you. It doesn't matter what anybody else does. God hasn't changed towards you. You just need to learn to receive of them. And where is God's love for a Christian? It's in your heart right now. You already possess it, even if you don't yield to it. 1%, the love of God lives inside of you. And you can change. You just need to renew your mind with the Word. The Word of God. The Word of love. God is love. Right? So I'm flowing with the Word of God. That's the Word of love. I'm flowing with the Holy Ghost. Led by the Spirit. The Spirit of who? Spirit of God. You can't walk with God and not walk with God. It's impossible. But it's stopped you. Just like that. Dead in your tracks. That's why the devil wants you offended so much. You get offended, you're gone. Doesn't matter who you are. Doesn't matter what anybody else did to you. If you get offended, your walk is short circuited immediately. It's done. Stand your feet. This is one of the worst things that's in the body today is offense. You say, you don't believe what so and so did? Well, talk more about what Jesus has done for you instead of what people have done to you. Amen? You're going to deal with those kind of things the rest of your life. As the world gets worse and worse and more selfishness abounds, people are about themselves. It is true. A lot of people don't care about you, but you don't determine. They don't determine who you are and how you are. What is the first love? It, by Greek, it's the order of importance. It is, is we love God first above all things. Father, we come before you in Jesus' name. We love you and thank you for this day. Many blessings your hand upon us, your spirit leading and guiding us. We thank you today, Father. Yeah, we say these things and we mean these things, Father, so far as we understand it, but we thank you our understanding. Today, by the Spirit of God, been enlightened our minds, renewed with the Word. And, and we'll just see by our actions if we mean business. We'll see by our actions if we want you to move in our life. In the church, we'll just see it. Talk is cheap by itself. We don't mean what we say. So I want God to move in the church, and then I've got offense in the church. Towards my brother or sister, I'm lying to myself. It's not true. Don't mean what I say at all. Might as well not say it, and no purpose in praying it. Because you can't move for any vessel that's not yielded to the Spirit of God and the Spirit of love. Every head bowed and every eye closed, you say, I want to receive this God of love today. Never made Jesus Lord and Savior in my life. Don't know if I have to die or go to heaven. Don't know that I'm in the family of God. You can have what we call no soul salvation, God said in the Word. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart that God raised from the dead, you'll be saved. Whoever calls upon His name will be saved. You believe that Jesus, God gave Jesus to die. For our sins, paid the price, rose again on the third day. He accepted, God did, he accepted that precious innocent blood of the Lord Jesus as the payment for our sins to set us free from the bondage where we were bound by Satan as Adam said in the garden. You say, yes, Pastor, I want you to pray with me to make Jesus Lord of my life today. Slip your hand up boldly in the place. Anybody? Number two, you say, I'm a Christian. I have no doubt, but I got out of fellowship. I want to come back home today. I want to surrender my life to God today and Him to meet me where, right where I'm at. He said, if you confess that you sin, it's the same way we love. All you do is ask Him to forgive you. And if you've done somebody else wrong, that's the way I do it. If I miss it in my own walk, I just ask God to forgive me. If I happen to miss it in, in towards Miss Laura Lee, then I ask God to forgive me and ask her to forgive me. That's all you can do. You say, what if she doesn't forgive you? Well, she does forgive me. But if she didn't, I still am responsible to make sure my heart is clear and that I'm, I'm right with God. So you're here today and you say, I want you to pray with me to rededicate my life to God. Slip your hand up boldly. We'd be glad to pray for anybody in the place. God is with us. Thank God for the Word. Thank God for the Spirit. If you've got any special needs, you can come down now. And I'd be glad to pray with you. God is with us. Aren't you glad to be a Christian? Yes. Aren't you glad that God loves you? Yes. But do you have a responsibility with His love? Yes. Show it to your family. Show it to your friends. Show it to your enemies. Just show it to them by living for God. Right? Live in line with the Word. Work on 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8. Read the Amplified Version. Read it every day multiple times if you have to. And where it says love, say I. I am patient. I am kind. Right? I take no account of the evil done to me. Quote those things to yourself. Speak the Word. And it'll rise up inside of you. Cultivate your spirit. Bring the flesh into subjection. And you'll see the flow of the Spirit of God in your life like never before. God is with us. We love you. We appreciate you. Just youth this evening, right? No special meetings. You can be dismissed.